Alexander Destrel, thank you very much indeed for your availability to discuss the, the, the latest development with the D Digital Markets Act within the Digital Markets Research Hub. It's a pleasure to welcome you. You are known as, uh, as, a, as, as one of the most uh, impactful commentators on, on the Digital Markets Act over the last two and a half, three years, and, and, and even before. And interestingly, uh, different parties in these discussions do cite you quite often. And, and obviously, I wanted to use the, the significant part of this conversation to discuss some technicalities, some procedural elements uh, of the DMA enforcement. But I cannot resist the temptation to ask you the first, uh, the first question, more normative issue. We know that DMA means different things to different stakeholders of different commentators, different thinkers. Uh, what does DMA mean, mean, mean for you? What's the mission which the Commission had in mind while introducing this ambitious proposal? Uh, thank you very much, um, Anish, for your kind word and, and also for your invitation and also for, for this initiative, this dialogue that you organized uh, with several experts. I think it's extremely useful and needed to, um, to improve the understanding and now um, the enforcement of the, of the DMA. So, my understanding of the DMA is that uh, really um, the goal of the law is to, and, and therefore the goal of the Commission in enforcing the law would be to open um, digital markets uh, in order to increase uh, choice and innovation um, in European digital markets. So at the end of the day, you know, it's not that far from a kind of ordo liberal approach. Um, that has underpinned uh, some of the European antitrust, in particular at the beginning, and also uh, some of uh, economic regulation. So now, how, because this is a question which is often raised in debate around the DMA, you know, how in five or 10 years we will assess the success of the DMA and the success of the European Commission in enforcing the DMA. And I think that will be whether the digital market in Europe have been in a way shaken by um, competition and by new entrants. So it should not be a kind of market share approach in the sense that if um, the market share of Google or Meta or Amazon or um, Apple or other uh, gatekeeper has not decreased, it's a failure. I, 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 don't, I don't think that we should have that kind of approach, but we should um, see a change in the market. Uh, and changing the product offer in the market. If on the other hand, uh, and, and there is a risk to that, and we can come back later, um, the DMA in a way ossify the market in the sense that the current gatekeeper remain the current gatekeeper and the innovation only happen on the top of those gatekeeper, I'm not sure it will be such a success. So of course we need to have this innovation on the top of the gatekeeper, but we also need to have innovation at the core. And I think really that's how you will um, assess in five to 10 years um, the success of the DMA. Now, of course, that's not easy. Um, we know that enforcement will be, will be very complex and we will discuss that, but that's, I think, should be the aim of, of, of the commission, opening the market for new opportunities and, and then shaking the market for new innovation. And in this regard, obviously, the question is, given the two kind of fundamental objectives of the DMA is contestability and fairness, this kind of open-ended concept, as we all understand, um, what would be the relationship between them? Do they complement each other? Do they necessarily complement each other? Or maybe they conflict with each other occasionally or partially? And if they do conflict, what would be the proportions which, in your view, merit more protection and enhancement? Is it more about contestability or fairness or both? My impression is that this law is more about contestability than fairness. No, um, two things. So first, I mean, I'm not sure that um, the objective are contradictory. I mean, we may find some instances where uh, some tension may appear, um, that, that may well be the case. But I, I would tend to think that, in general, they are complementary. The second um, thing I want to say is that the, I think contestability is a little bit easier to define or less controversial, I would say, than fairness. Contestability is about uh, opening market or, if you want, reducing entry barriers. And I think if you, look, if you go to the different obligation of the DMA, uh, there are clear objectives of 
reducing strategic barrier, so the barriers which are set up by the firm, by in a way accelerating the intervention. So it's a kind of, the DMA is a kind of a speedy antitrust. But it's not only that, very often it is equated to accelerating antitrust, but it's not only that. I think the DMA can go further in the sense of um, removing or reducing some structural entry barriers that um, the antitrust cannot do. So for instance, you know, uh, there is a lot of access obligation uh, to some data or to some part of the platform, which can be achieved by the DMA without having to prove a form of essential facilities. So I think really the DMA not only accelerate antitrust, but also go further than antitrust in reducing uh, structural barrier to entry and not only in um, reducing strategic barrier to entry. So I think in a way the, the concept of contestability is um, relatively clearer than the concept of fairness because we know that everyone in a way has its own conception of fairness. Uh, we have a form of um, ex ante fairness, a sort of level playing field, which is often mentioned by um, uh, Executive Vice President Vestager and I think this form of th this conception of um, fairness, ex ante fairness or level playing field is very close to the conception of contestability. But then there is another conception which is more ex post fairness or distributional fairness. And, and that's of course, it's not the same. You know? And I, I think that um, the DMA is a little bit, a bit of both. I mean, it's ex ante fairness clearly because it's about contestability. But there are also elements of redistribution of the rent, um, which um, of the value which is created uh, by the gatekeeper and a redistribution between or among the gatekeeper and the business user. So I think there is also an aspect of uh, uh, strict ex post fairness, uh, for instance, in the uh, obligation on uh, friend access to app store or social network. The question of course is how we will define what is a fair access? And there, you know, we don't really have um, a lot of rules. We have, and more and more, the economic theory uh, provide us with some solution, but still it's preliminary. What we have, however, is a kind of a framework, procedural framework to help uh, the parties to get to uh, a kind of um, fairness or friend access in this, in this case. So we have, for instance, in the Huawei case, um, which has been decided in the context of standard essential patent, uh, a kind of framework for good faith negotiation, which has been set in place. And the question is uh, by the Court of Justice, and the question is how far um, this framework uh, would also be useful. So a kind of procedural framework to get to um, ex post fairness or distributional, distributional fairness would be useful here. I think it will, but I mean, um, the, we, we will see with the implementation how, how this kind of obligation are going to. But as you started, uh, you, you, you covered several important issues which I wanted to pick up on. But the first one, the, the, the access obligations, the nature of access obligations, I think you argued elsewhere or mentioned that um, they are inherently problematic because we're talking about uh, you know how should we should should the gatekeeper charge for the for the access? What would be the the, the what under what conditions, etc. Uh, you, you are among other things uh, specialized in different uh, regulatory models. So we talk, we're not not, not I'm, I'm not talking necessarily about different jurisdictions. I'm mainly talking about different that different network industry industries which have been liberalized in the past. So maybe you can somehow identify some good examples, good uh, initiatives and success stories, which we somehow can take on board in, in enforcing the DMA. Yes, um, first, I think we should look at success story, but also failure uh, to inform the DMA. I think both are equally useful in a way uh, to inform uh, the DMA um, enforcement. I think there are two industries which interest me particularly. One is the telecom industry, and, and many people have drawn the parallel between uh, telecom regulation and, and the DMA because telecom regulation is really also, was really in Europe, was really about opening telecom uh, network to increase competition, to increase first service-based competition and then infrastructure-based competition. 
So I think it's a very useful um, it's a very useful benchmark in a way, also because we have seen there how difficult it is to impose um, access obligation or, for instance, number portability, which is a, an easy thing to do compared to uh, what needs to be done in the DMA. So sometimes, you know, when I see the deadline which are imposed in the DMA uh, by the text, I think they are a bit over ambitious to say the least. When we see the experience and the difficulty of enforcing some access obligation in telecom. Now, my point is not to say that it's impossible or it should not be done, not at all. I think it should be done and it's possible to do, but that takes time because in fact, you have to organize a framework for negotiation between um, the gatekeeper and the business user. And I am not so sure that for those obligations, so it's some of them and the access obligation, I mean, the DMA has other kind of obligation which are probably easier to enforce and therefore, could be enforced and uh, enforced uh, in, in a quicker manner. But for those kind of obligations, I think what telecom um, um, tell us is first, um, it is complicated, it takes time, but it's possible. And second, that you need to have a good framework for negotiation between um, the uh, gatekeeper uh, or the um, access giver and the uh, access seeker, the business user in this case. So that's one industry which I think is in interesting to look at. The other one which is interesting to look at is finance regulation. And that is for a different reason, not so much because um, access obligation have been imposed, but because um, it's a regulation which is, um, I mean, it's a sector which is very complex and evolving very quickly, like um, the tech sector, like the big tech. And it's a sector where um, comply because of this complexity and because of the massive asymmetry of information between um, the regulated company and the regulator, very much um, of the enforcement is based on compliance. You know? And I think one of the key um, features of the DMA is uh, the compliance report and the compliance officer that uh, the gatekeeper will have to um, would ha will have to establish. Now, I mean, that's absolutely essential for the success of the DMA because, uh, because of this asymmetry of information, this massive asymmetry of information. And so um, good and bad lessons that we have, that we can see in finance could be useful here. So for instance, uh, I'm not at all a specialist of finance and regulation. So I am, I am really talking here uh, with a lot of cautious and, I guess that in your next dialogue with uh, uh, on the DMA, you may uh, some uh, sometimes invite a specialist of financial regulation. But my impression is that sometimes um, the compliance report are a form of ticking the box exercise, so very formalistic, but not really looking at the problem as such. And I think that is a danger that uh, we could have with the DMA. Um, we, I mean, the commission uh, and, and the enforcer has to be pragmatic, not too much, you know, formalistic or procedural. Now, the risk, of course, to be formalistic or procedural is that it's easier to be than to be pragmatic. So, you know, if you are under strong pressure and um, to deliver, uh, you may have a tendency to do a kind of ticking the box exercise, like we have seen in some of the banking regulation or, or for, by some enforcer of the banking regulation. I think so, uh, that's what we should learn from. So, you know, uh, telecom, I think it's interesting for, for access obligation, uh, finance is interesting for um, compliance culture uh, and also uh, warn us to have a kind, not to have a, a ticking the box culture, uh, but a, a really pragmatic culture. And I want to pick on the last point you, you, you mentioned, Alexandra. Um, namely on this, that we are transitioning, that there is kind of towards smart regulation, supposedly, and we are abandoning the system where regulate and forget, as you mentioned uh, uh, elsewhere, to the system of kind of more agile regulation, where you learn as, a, as an enforcer, as a regulator, you, you continuously learn, you are engaged proactively uh, in constant regulatory dialogue with the uh, with gatekeepers, third parties, different stakeholders have different interpretation, different readings of what should be enforced and what proportions, where the priorities, how to to draw priorities, etc. So it must be a huge challenge for uh, this kind of middle middle rank enforcers, 
not the high, top level who are inherently political and get used to different bargaining games, but those who are actually trained to be diligent box stickers. I, I don't want to use it pejoratively. It's, it's, it's a difficult task. So they are somehow re, 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 regaining new skills. Do you think this journey will, will be thorny, challenging? It will surely be, but that's why it's interesting in a way. But um, so here I want to make um, several points. So first, I mean, as you say, I mean, what we need is a form of agile uh, regulation and regulator. And I think here I would point um, uh, to an OECD, a recent OECD recommendation of 2021 on agile regulation, which is really, you know, a, a sort of advice for the regulator of what do you what do you want to do or what do you need to do if you want to be agile and if you want in a way uh, uh, regulating a complex world uh, which is the world today in in tech and and there is another interesting readings which is a report by the world economic forum on the same issue of uh, agile regulation and there is a lot of parallel in fact between the um, OECD recommendation and the report of the World Economic Forum. But what is interesting in the report of the World Economic Forum is that you have a lot of examples in many countries and many industries of um, regulators, big and small, having done those kind of agile regulation. So, you know, I, I, I take your point about the size, but I think it's more an issue about the culture. You know, and in fact, sometimes we see that the smaller regulators tends to be more agile than the bigger one because they have um, they, they are small and, and they some, sometimes they are new. And so they are composed of people which are uh, of a kind of a, a more agile spirit. By the way, it's the same thing that you see in company, private company. You know, the, the smaller startup tends to be more agile and um, every, every, everything equal than uh, the, um, the biggest company. So, you know. I think that regulators uh, would need to be agile. Now, what, do, what does it mean? I think there are at least three things that um, an agile regulator, uh, a regulator should do. The first is to have participatory regulation. So participatory regulation means that it's not uh, there, uh, just a bilateral relationship between the regulator and the regulated firm and the regulators know what's good and impose it in a form of command and control approach to, uh, the, uh, uh, regulate, uh, to the regulated company. And then as you say, um, regulated and forget um, and hope for the best. But it's more you know, a system where you um, involve all the stakeholders and the regulators become a kind of an orchestrator of an ecosystem of compliance and enforcement. So you rely on the gatekeeper and uh, their compliance officer, as we, were as we were discussing before, but you rely also on the business user, uh, which of course have an interest in having the DMA um, uh, uh, effective. That required that the, compli the summary of the compliance report that the uh, gatekeeper will produce the non-confidential summary should be sufficiently meaningful for those business users to play an active role in the enforcement. And then you have the civil society like uh, you and me or NGO or, uh, and so on, which are um, happy to help. You know? And so I think it will be very important that um, the commission rely on those, um, on those um, external experts. Now, I must say here that the DSA, the Digital Services Act, is probably a little bit better in that regard because it has a provision which allows the commission or the digital service coordinator to transfer data, confidential data, from uh, the authority to those vetted researchers. We don't have an equivalent provision in the DMA, and, and, and I think it's a pity, but uh, okay, uh, there are probably other ways to, to work with, um, with the civil society. Um, and, and then the third, of course, big players which can help the commission in this ecosystem of compliance and enforcement are the national authority. Now, we know that the national authority are not uh, the ultimate enforcer of the DMA. Um, the DMA has been centralized to the commission and I think it's a very, very good thing, but uh, the national authority may help the commission in uh, achieving its task, in particular, for instance, by hearing complaint of the business user, which tends to be local, or by uh, participating to the to the investigation. So one thing is participation. The other thing is experimentation. 
So uh, again, it's not a regulate and forget, but it's regulate and adapt, you know, uh, learn and adapt. So I think it will be very important that uh, there is uh, this um, openness to, to, um, to adapt and, and learn from mistake. Now, of course, there is a tension here between experimentation, adaptation on the one hand, and legal certainty on the others. Uh, it's clear that some of the obligation will require a kind of product redesign, which is not easy to do by the gatekeeper. And so you cannot change every, every three months uh, what you require. So uh, there is a tension here, but I think that what is important in particular at the beginning of the enforcement of the, of the DMA is that there is a phase of a learning phase where um, the commission could adapt if it doesn't work. And in fact, it is provided to some extent in the DMA huh, because the commission may re-specify an obligation if it thinks that the specification was not um, did not lead to a, a, a sufficient effective enforcement of the DMA. And then the last element uh, in the agile regulation, so next to particip uh, participatory regulation and uh, experimentation, is the use of um, AI technique to improve the enforcement. You know, so we know that um, AI technique can be extremely useful for company to improve their operation, uh, but they can also be extremely useful for a regulator to improve uh, their uh, task. And we see a development of those kind of what they are called sometimes a sub tech uh, supervisory technology. And again, there, I think banking regulator are very um, useful because this seems to be uh, among the most advanced uh, regulator in using AI. So basically, you know, and to summarize, I think that if you follow those advice of the OECD, if you um, follow those three elements of uh, participation, experimentation, and use of AI technique, the enforcement uh, could, be, um, could be effective and proportionate. But there are obviously many questions related to this uh, to this new modality, in, in, which is kind of a, becoming a new objective reality. So whether we want it or not, from the left, people will we definitely already hear these voices that the more you interact, the more gatekeepers and regulators interact, the the, the higher the risk of regulate of different types of regulatory capture. From the right, it's on the contrary, and it, because it's so interpretive and open to you know to so many different meanings, uh, you can you will start injecting as an enforcer different socio legal, economic, macroeconomic values into uh, in, into these obligations. But there is one more more kind of more procedural, and it leads me to the kind of to, to the phenomenon of leniency, decrease of popularity of leniency once we start applying more and more proactively private enforcement mechanism. Uh, don't you think that this fruit uh, of uh, kind of short regulatory procedural shortcuts coming from the antitrust path, where designed uh, this fruit were designed so low, only for single enforcer for the commission precisely to avoid all this kind of uh, ten years litigation, etc. If we open the door, we did it partially at least to private enforcement, particularly collective. Is there a risk that they will start just cherry picking and somehow free riding and, and thus discouraging gatekeepers to engage in the proactive kind of core regulatory model where they shape the, the ecosystem as, as you mentioned, or is it just purely hypothetical scenario? No, 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 you are very right. I think, I think, um, I think, um, Private enforcement has pros and cons, obviously, uh, as everything in life. Um, the pros is that it supports, in a way, uh, the effectiveness of the law uh, because you multiply the number of enforcers. And we know that, um, in general, um, the effectiveness of a law is uh, correlated with the number of enforcers. Uh, that's a general principle, in fact, of EU law. And this is why, if you go back to the first uh, um, case uh, of the European Court of Justice about the direct effect, this is what they say, you know, we need to, melt. I mean, we, we can, mul by multiplying the number of enforcers, you um, increase the effectiveness of EU law, and this is why um, the uh, Court of Justice opened the enforcement of the European law in general to, um, to national judges, and the DMA being a regulation uh, has, of course, direct effect. So um, that's the positive aspect. There is the, the less positive aspect that you mentioned is that uh, this private enforcement may in a way um, lead 
to uh, some difficulty in enforcement, in particular for the obligation which are not um, easy to enforce. I would say that for some obligation and mostly the Article 5 obligation, you could say that they are more or less um, self-enforcing. Um, some are more, some less. But so I am less worried about uh, private enforcement regarding Article 5 obligation than the one regarding Article 6. Now, the thing is this. Um, the DMA provide that there is possibility for the commission to intervene in a, in a private enforcement action. Uh, so there is a whole uh, mechanism of cooperation between the commission and the national court, uh, which is set up in the DMA very much inspired by antitrust. And I think it's very important that the commission use it. Uh, and that, um, for instance, if an obligation, Article 6 obligation has not yet been specified, I think that um, the national court should be extremely cautious before uh, enforcing it. There is, however, as you, we all know, the possibility for the uh, national judge to um, ask a preliminary ruling question to the Court of Justice. I expect a lot of question, like uh, for every new European law, it will lead to a lot of um, clarification by the Court of Justice. Now, those clarification may um, come either from contesting uh, a, a commission decision or from a preliminary ruling uh, of the national judge. And the advantage of the preliminary ruling is that it tends to be quicker uh, than uh, the action for an annulment against a commission decision. So um, I, that's maybe also a kind of a, a other advantage. But so all in all, I think that private enforcement, if it is well managed, um, and I mean by that, there is a good cooperation between the European Commission and the national court, and uh, the judges tends to focus on um, the easy uh, obligation, uh, I think that can work. If on the other hand, uh, this cooperation don't work very well and the judge started to, the national judge started to interpret article six obligation uh, um, in some creative way. And therefore, as you say, that will be used by uh, the um, business user to in a way, gets their rent to their advantage, but not, not necessarily to the advantage of the whole system, that would be a problem. Because we also uh, should um, be very much aware that not every business user has the same interest and wants the same thing, you know? And that's one thing which worries me also, because we say um, to the gatekeeper, you have to find the good solution to comply with the DMA and you have to find it, it's your responsibility and show that in uh, the compliance report. That's how the law is drafted. Um, and, and so indeed it is their responsibility. But then what do you do if you have several uh, competing business user asking different things, you know? Who you should um, comply, I mean, who you should please in a way and who you should displease. And that's not an easy um, choice to be made. And, 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 and whether you please one and displease the other, whether this is right or this is not right, I mean, at the end of the day, it will be uh, up to the commission and then ultimately the court to decide. But so I think that is there, you have a tension there, which is probably easily solvable when it's the commission, which at the end of the day has to assess the compliance than when it is a multiple, uh, a multiplicity of national uh, judges. So in a way that's reinforced uh, the um, argument that I was saying before that we have to have a strong um, and close cooperation between the commission and the national judges in the enforcement of the DMA, because we know that all the interests of the um, business user are not aligned and that they can, because of this uh, disalignment, they can, use private enforcement to serve their own interest, but not the interest of the, of the, of the consumer welfare in general. And as a follow-on uh, 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 question, uh, Alexander, do you think that this DMA case law, the emerging DMA case law would be, a, would be this kind of a sui generis autonomous area where, with new judgments somehow shaping the future enforcement, constraining maybe even the future enforcement the future, because currently it looks that the, the, the commission has not carte blanche, but very discretionary 
um, competences open to interpretation. Do you think that the, the, the next, the first wave of cases will somehow constrain it or maybe expand? Well, that's difficult to tell. I mean, the best would be probably to invite a judge at the next uh, conversation, although I'm not sure the judge would be ready to, to advance so much at this stage. So, you know, it's very much depend. What I would say is um, several things. So first, I'm not sure that the antitrust case law would be so useful here. You know, many people see, still uh, have not get that um, the DMA is not an antitrust law or not even an antitrust plus law. I mean, it's economic regulation and it has its own logic. You no, know? um, so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be too, let's say, I don't think that by looking at all the antitrust case, you will learn a lot about the DMA. Of course, you will learn, but uh, you will. I mean, I don't think that is the ultimate answer about the DMA. But um, for the um, more, more generally, I think that the case law of the court will, of course, in a way, set a direction and maybe, and, and in a way, set the, the limits in which the commission should, should intervene. I tend to think that because it's a regulation, the court may be more willing to follow the commission than in antitrust because, I mean, and here, you know, you have there two, two school of thought. Some, some are saying, okay, because regulation go further and um, give more power to the commission, the um, court should be stricter than in antitrust in controlling the power of the commission. Okay, that's one school of thought. The other one is saying the exact contrary, say, because there is a regulation and there is in a way a legislative mandate um, given by the parliament and the council to the commission to do something and to shake the market. Um, in a way, the commission should execute this, this le legislative mandate and the court should not come in the way of the commission to execute that legislative mandate. So, you know, we, we will see, but my experience from telecom regulation is that the court tends to be, um, now, of course, the situation is a little bit different here because we don't have the commission as the European regulatory authority, but we have the national uh, authority, but there has been some preliminary ruling question by the national judge uh, hearing appeal against national authority. And what the court has been is, you know, um, relatively different to uh, uh, the national authority. So I would say that um, the court will play a very, very important role um, in interpreting the law, but also in setting the balance between uh, different objectives. Because we have on the one hand contestability and openness, which is the overall objective, but then we have other consideration which uh, may sometimes come in tension, like privacy, like security, like integrity of services. And uh, the DMA recognize that there is a, a trade off here, but don't decide, which, which is good. I mean, I think because it's a case by case analysis, and so it's up to uh, the commission and then uh, the court to, to, to assess that. But so I think. Um, that would be an important thing to, to have in mind is that the court will have to arbitrate a number of trade-offs. And in particular, you know, what will, what, well, one of the trade-offs which interests me a lot is the trade-off between contestability and privacy. Because we know that uh, the Court of Justice has taken a very expensive view in um, privacy, in the interpretation of the GDPR, personally too expensive. But okay, that's the case law. Uh, but so this very expensive interpretation of the GDPR may uh, come in the way of an objective of contestability, you know, because on the one hand, you would say you should limit data mobility, personal data mobility, because it may affect privacy. And on the other hand, you want sometimes to improve personal data uh, mobility because it may help um, opening the market and contestability. And so, that tension um, where uh, on the first term of the debate, we have a number of case law coming from the GDPR and the other term of the debate, contestability, we don't have yet case law um, in this very context of the DMA. I think that would be very, very interesting to, uh, to observe the first case on that, on that tension. Absolutely, and you know, you, it could be, well, it could well be the case that by, by being driven by, you know, very, uh, you know, 
not altruistic, but very beneficial objectives. We somehow can disarm the, the, the power of, of, of the DMA, intentionally or not. But let me ask you then the, about another set of principles, which we, we understand that principles uh, often conflict with each other, uh, which are essential for the DMA, namely effectiveness and proportionality. It's a long discussion. We understand that the very logic of the DMA implies somehow disproportional enforcement the addressees of the rules, discretion of the of the enforcer. So it somehow envisages in, inherently this some elements of disproportionate enforcement. Then and uh, obviously we have the principle, overarching principle of pro proportionality, which is the the general EU EU law principle. And also actually Article Eight One acknowledges somehow diminishes the, the 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 omnipotence of the effectiveness principle by referring to other law which has to be which has to be observed, somehow making the rules proportionate. What is your position uh, uh, on, on this kind of inevitable, not clash, but somehow discrepancy between effectiveness and proportionality? Yes, yeah, so um, I wouldn't say that necessarily the, the DMA is disproportionate. I mean, I think it's a choice which has been made by the legislature that we had to um, uh, regulate uh, the big tech, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it's disproportionate per se. But as you say, I mean, there is a, a two principles which should guide the, inter the interpretation and the enforcement of the DMA. One is effectiveness and the other one is proportionality. Now, regarding effectiveness, the Article 8 that you mentioned is, is very clear. I mean, we have two forms of effectiveness, effectiveness. One is with regard to the overall objective of the DMA, uh, contestability and fairness, as we discussed. And the other one is a kind of a specific effectiveness that each obligation should be effective in its own way. So we have a form of double effectiveness, uh, which uh, should guide the, the uh, application and the interpretation of the provision. And then we have the principle of proportionality, which is a general principle of EU law, as you recall. So of course it will apply uh, to the DMA like um, every other uh, EU law and uh, which is mentioned sometimes uh, specifically in the, um, in the text. And I think here also we have two possible uh, um, application of uh, the principle of proportionality. One um, would in a way limit what the commission can do uh, to achieve the objective. So the commission should not impose or interpret the obligation in a way which go too far. And in that sense, it's a protection uh, for the gatekeeper, uh, but also the proportionality principle will be the guiding principle to decide the trade-off, the many trade-off that you have in the law between different objectives and different rights. We mentioned already before um, this tension or trade-off between contestability and privacy, and I think proportionality will be uh, the instrument to try to accommodate uh, that trade-off. And as we discussed before, it will be at the end of the day up to the court to decide where to put the balance between different objectives, but on the basis of, of the principle of proportionality. A third element that I wanted to say uh, about proportionality is that we don't have an efficiency defense. I mean, it's very clear. Uh, the, the, the text is absolutely clear uh, on that. Uh, it's not the antitrust rationale. We don't have an efficiency defense to justify a conduct. But on the other hand, um, that doesn't mean that we don't have economic analysis altogether, you know, because there is sometimes in some debates some confusion between you know, not uh, applying the antitrust principle, like um, the principle of um, like uh, uh, the uh, efficiency defense or the market definition and the economic analysis. We don't have uh, the antitrust principle, but I think we still have to some extent economic analysis. And uh, the economic analysis, one way to enter into, uh, to be uh, applied into the DMA enforcement will be through the principle of proportionality. Because at the end of the day, you know, what the pr principle of proportionality is telling you is that you have to do a cost and, and cost and benefit analysis of specific interpretation. And for that, we would need economic analysis. So, you know, I think that um, the economic analysis is not out of the way uh, at all. And so that may be a good news for the economist. 
uh, but it's just that it will be used in a different manner uh, than it is in antitrust and through the proportionality principle, uh, for instance. So basically it will not be used to justify as an excuse, but to explain the rationale of specific conduct. And, and also in addition to what you said earlier, the different uh, stakeholders interpret this, the identical provision in, uh, in different fashion, depending on the myriad of, of circumstances and interests as well. And also I noticed that in one of your early paper, I think it was one of this uh, co-authors, this Amelia Fletcher, you mentioned that the focus should not be of the enforcers, should not be on analyzing in abstract to the core platform services as such, but rather on the business model of specific gatekeepers. So you somehow have to look the center of gravity should be placed on the gatekeepers more than on, on the core platform services. Can you elaborate on this, please? What's the reason for this? Yes, so, well, I mean, that, that's a subtle and a difficult question because, of course, DMA is not like what the UK has in mind to have a system which is very much tailored um, to each business model. And um, that's not the approach which has been taken by the DMA, so the DMA is, uh, you know, independently, if you want, of your business model, you have uh, to have uh, uh, to apply a number of obligations. Now, we must say that some obligations are, um, let's say, um, core platform service specifics, and so will only apply to some form of um, services. At least others are ap uh, applicable for all um, for all um, all services. But um, what we wanted to say, I think, in this in this paper is that. It's not because you have um, not taken the, let's say, the, um, the UK approach that you should completely ignore business reality and business model, you know? And so to some extent, and again, through the principle of proportionality, um, you will have to um, adapt, let's say, uh, the um, obligation to the nature of what you want to regulate. And also what we wanted to say is that at the European Commission, you will have um, people, um, I guess, specialized per each obligation, but also, and, and that's a good thing, but also it's very important that there is someone also who has an overall um, view of the company. Because, you know, there is a risk that if you analyze each obligation independently without looking at the overall company, which is behind, there is a risk that you know you try to evade uh, one part of the regulation by doing something else, you know. And so this holistic approach is important. Or uh, on the other way around, you know, maybe one of the problems that you have in the market or the barriers to entry that you have could be solved by one obligation, and therefore you need less the other obligation. You know. So I think that it's very important next to um, uh, looking obligation by obligation individual to have a kind of holistic view of those if the effect of all those obligations to a specific uh, gatekeeper um, again that does not lead us to a kind of uk regime but that um would uh, and i would say that the difference between the eu and the uk regime are not as big as sometimes they are they are presented if my just I wanted to illustrate my understanding of of uh, of, of of this model by using a hypothetical example, let's say Bing meets the requirements of core platform services, but the more holistic approach would suggest that well we all understand that such and as such is somehow dominated by a different gatekeeper, so it would be somehow against the rationale of competition within within a horizontal. Uh, search engines to somehow to designate Bing as a gatekeeper. But then once we hear the news about open AI cooperation between Microsoft and open AI, this changes the story again. And it somehow trigger me as an enforcer to look at the story again in, from through different perspective. So I have to be more open to the, to, to, to the context in, in this regard and the position of gatekeeper in this, in this specific core platform service. Is it the way how it should be in a sense or? Yes, but I mean, and, and that's the tricky, the tricky thing, you know, um, to some extent, you, you cannot ignore the economic reality and the business reality. On the other hand, the law is sometimes uh, relatively rigid. And the reason is clear is that um, the rigidity is 
linked to the fact that it's probably easier to enforce a law which is rigid. So the commission should use as much as possible the flexibility that you have in the law, but sometimes, and some would say unfortunately, some would say fortunately, uh, this flexibility is relatively limited. So to take your example about designating a Bing or not as a core platform services, as you say, well, I don't know, the, I, I don't have the number. So I, I mean, I think here it's really hypothetical because I, I have no um, specific view on Bing because I don't have the numbers. But um, let's say that if Bing meets um, the quantitative criteria, there is a reputable presumption that it should be designated. And yes, the commission could um, rebut that presumption on the basis of qualitative criteria, but that's not easy. No, I would tend to say that it's true that the texts say that's not easy, but that's not a reason not to try and, and to try to push as much as you can to, uh, to, 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 to have a kind of um, um, designation which reflect, as you were saying, uh, the business reality. Uh, and so uh, I would advise the commission, recommend the commission to use as much as possible the flexibility which is within the law to try to, uh, to be close to the business reality. Now, the thing is that the rigidity of the law uh, may be justified for this first generation of uh, uh, DMA. We know that the DMA will be changed in uh, five to uh, five to ten years, huh? because that's the case of every uh, European law. So it's not because it's a DMA, but every European law tends to tends to to be amended uh, every five to ten years, and that is a big difference with US law, which you know once they are adopted, they tends to stay because it's the legislative process in the US at the federal level at least is more complicated, even more complicated than in, uh, than the, in the European Union. So, you know, I think in, in that kind of dynamic perspective, it may have made sense to have a law which is relatively rigid at the beginning because it's easier to enforce. And so it leaves the possibility for the enforcers to learn. And then once the enforcer, um, in this case, the commission has learned and it has become better, uh, then you can move to uh, something which is a little bit more flexible. Um, and in fact, this is exactly what has happened in the telecom regulation that we were discussing earlier. You know? The first telecommunication law were extremely rigid. You know, uh, market were predefined in the directive. Uh, everyone who has 25% market share uh, of those predefined market has an old suit of obligation. So the 97 directive was very rigid. And then it's only in 2002, so some years after, that the uh, Parliament and the Council decide to make a, reg a regime, uh, a regulatory regime, which is more flexible and uh, closer to economic reality and economic analysis. So, you know, because many people are criticizing uh, the rigidity of the DMA, and, and I understand their criticism, but on the other hand, if we look at that uh, from a dynamic perspective, in the sense that you start with something which is rigid, rigid because it's easier to enforce. And then as you learn, uh, you uh, evolve to a regime which is more flexible. This is not necessarily a bad uh, policy choice. In any case, um, the good thing about Brexit, there are a lot of bad things, but the good thing about Brexit is that we will have you no know, kind of um, real life experimentation because we will have the EU with a relatively rigid system and uh, the UK with a more flexible system, and then we can compare. But again, I also wanted to say, and to come back to, the, to your question, that the, the differences uh, may, are, are probably not as high as they are, are they pretend to be, because even in EU law, I think you have some um, places of flexibility that should be used to be closer, uh, to be as close as possible to the business reality. Uh, th thank you very much, Alexander, for, the, for, for this answer. I think we, we only have time for three or, or, or four shorter questions. So I wanted to, to ask you, coming back to this participatory model or regulatory dialogue, the, 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 the Commission in its original proposal has designed the tool of commitment, which was kind of transposed from, from antitrust uh, uh, mechanism of regulation 2003, uh, and then eventually, in the, in the final version of the DMA, we see that it's only limited to the uh, market investigation, in the, uh, uh, suspecting the instances of systematic non-compliance. Uh, 
Do you think that the mechanism of commitment would be more effective if it would be uh, used more generously in all cases? But I think, you know, um, the, the idea of the commitment is that the, the solution in a way comes from, uh, from the company, okay? And I think that uh, this is very much the case um, here in the DMA, even if it is not called commitment, uh, by the fact that it's up to the um, gatekeeper to come with a solution in the compliance report. And if it doesn't work, the commission will say it it's not good enough, so come with something else and so on. So I think, you know, this logic which underpin the commitment in antitrust is there all over. So um, I think that is, I would say, um, broader than just commitment. And I think that's a good thing for the um, asymmetry of information that we were discussing before. But um, as we also pointed before, there is of course a risk of capture that those commitments do, do not go far enough or are not um, um, effective enough to uh, solve uh, the problem uh, or to ensure uh, contestability and fairness. And so therefore in this case, it's very important that for every solution which is uh, proposed by the gatekeeper, um, so being a formal commitment or being, I would say, um, in the compliance report, um, it's very important that the third party, I mean, the business user um, first, and, and maybe also the civil society in the second stage, give their view whether indeed it's effective and proportionate, you know. And it's very important that when deciding whether um, those commitments are enough, or whether what uh, the gatekeeper proposed in their compliance report that's effective enough that the commission listen to those um, listen to those uh, business user and uh, and uh, and civil society to to learn whether whether that's enough or, or not but but as we have said one of the difficulty in listening to all those business user and that you will have different voices and the question is what are the voices that we think are reasonable for the overall welfare and what are the voice which are only about um, a, a specific uh, rent seeking exercise and uh, the gatekeeper and then the commission will have to um, discriminate between those and that will not be uh, that will not be easy but the general idea of uh, participation and of the fact that the solution should come from uh, the um, from uh, the gatekeeper provide that it's, they are not uh, alone to decide uh, seems to be a good one. This links me perfectly to the question which I wanted to ask you. Uh, we live a kind of a, in a, a polycentric and uh, pluralistic uh, environment where the boundaries between the kind of institutions are getting less uh, robust, so to say, and the role of civic society is increasing. Uh, it has been recently announced that the, the think tank which you di academically direct, Sir, uh, it is introducing a mechanism which, uh, at least the prelim preliminary title, is the Forum on the DMA Compliance, which essentially, it looks to me from the uh, purely observer perspective, would be as, uh, one of the places where different voices and interests would be somehow have would have an opportunity to to be tested and presented and discussed in a more open and less binding, so to say, a fashion. Can you elaborate a little bit on, on this initiative of motivation and expectations from it, please? You know, exactly. I think you understand very well what we wanted to do is we wanted to be a forum for a, a trusted dialogue, trusted and steer dialogue to help the enforcement. Now, of course, we don't want to substitute what the commission is doing. So the commission is having its own uh, workshop, open workshop. So the idea is not to replicate what the commission is doing. And of course, the idea is not to say what's right and what's wrong. I mean, that's the role of the commission at the end of the day. And uh, we don't want in any way to substitute the work of the commission, but we want to, as many other um, think tank or civil society organization help um, the commission in having a kind of proportionate and effective enforcement of the DMA. So uh, practically um, in that forum that uh, we have launched uh, uh, last, um, this month, um, um, with the, the, the report on the DMA that we, we presented. This, this year, what we would like to do is three things. One, um, and the first one is to try to find for each of the 22 obligation or prohibition, some form of metrics. You know? Because the fact is that um, 
Now, a lot of, and that's what we show in the report um, that we presented in January, uh, there are a lot of, there are still a lot, in particular for Article 6 obligation, interpretation issues, you know. And, you know, in a way, that's normal. I mean, it's a law, in a, it's a new law, and it's a, a complex environment. So it's not saying that doesn't say that the law is bad. It's just that it's, it's difficult uh, because of the environment, as you were mentioning. And so one thing which can help, uh, let's say, to focus the mind of the gatekeeper, the business user, and the commission is to have some quantitative matrix for each obligation to say, okay, this is in which direction that you, we wanted to go, okay? Now, of course, those quantitative matrix will not be, um, you, you cannot um, resume uh, uh, or, or summarize uh, an obligation with that quantitative matrix, but that will help to discuss compliance and effectiveness. So that's one thing. The other thing we wanted to do in that forum is to think about, in particular for access obligation, what should be the process of dialogue and negotiation between the gatekeeper and their business user um, to uh, have uh, an effective and proportionate enforcement. And here, we wanted to be inspired by what has been done in some um, other network industry, and because Sarah is active in uh, energies and telecom, and so we have some experiences from those sectors and see how the experiences in, in those sectors in terms of procedures to um, negotiate and to discuss could be, um, could be useful. And then the third thing and last thing that we want to do in that forum is uh, to uh, push a little bit further what we have done uh, last year uh, with um, the report on what are the issues to um, uh, interpret or um, uh, the, the difficult issue of interpretation and application of the DMA and to try to go one step further and maybe to try to design some technical principle for uh, interpretation and implementation. Now, we will still remain at the relatively general level because again, we don't want to uh, substitute the commission and become an enforcer, but we think that there is still uh, a space uh, for the civil society to come with uh, a technical principle. And in the spirit of SER, we will, um, in that forum, we will have some gatekeeper, some business user, and the civil society, and some enforcer, national and the commission, around the, around the table for what we hope to have a constructive discussion. Interesting, very, very promising. We obviously, uh, as our uh, conversation uh, goes to the uh, approach on this end, we have the tradition of asking a question, uh, recommendation for students, those who begin this journey in, in very exciting times. But before asking this question, Alexander, I wanted to ask you also a question about a, a specific obligation, which in the course of this, uh, of this one plus year of the discussions has transformed or matured into a, a separate article, uh, Article 7. Obviously, it would we can discuss or you can talk about this for, for a very long time. I just wanted to ask what, what was so specific about inter, interoperability obligation, which, not, which, which impelled the, the co-legislators to, to change the original proposal to such a significant, significant extent. Can you, can you explain uh, your understanding of things, please? Yeah, so first, um, there are two forms of interoperability. We have the horizontal interoperability, which is the interoperability among competitors, let's say. So, for instance, among uh, two uh, communication apps or among two social networks. And then you have the vertical interoperability, which is um, an interoperability among complementary services. So, you know, it is when, uh, uh, for instance, uh, a payment services wants to, uh, wants to be a, a complement to an app store. So, um, the vertical interoperability was already in the Commission proposal and has been confirmed in Article um, in several provisions of Article 6. So on that, I mean, of course, some uh, refinement have been done during the negotiation, but the, uh, there was not a, a, a big innovation during the negotiation. What was the big innovation that you mentioned is Article 7 is about horizontal interoperability. That at the beginning, the Commission did not propose uh, because I think, but of course, um, you have to check that with the Commission itself, uh, they thought that with multi owning uh, we have enough um, a form of competition uh, among uh, the operators, and so probably the Commission did not see the need of uh, having an, inter uh, an horizontal interoperability obligation. 
the legislature and in particular the parliament uh, thought that it could be useful to have um, next to those possibility of multi homing to have um, um, horizontal interoperability because it's true that for some services it's easy to multi home for instance for communication app uh, and all of us, I, I think, uh, have multiple communication app on our smartphone or on our PC. But for others, uh, where you have, when you upload a lot of content, uh, like for instance on social network, it's less easy to multi -home because you know you are in a way uh, uh, you don't want to uh, reload every time you go on another uh, social network all the content that you have loaded on your first social network. So maybe for those, um, uh, uh, let's say services which multi-homing is less present, interoperability uh, would be more useful. But we know that interoperability is difficult to do. And at the end of the day, you know, this first generation of the law limited horizontal interoperability for communication app and do not foresee at this stage for a social network where maybe it would have been more useful. Um, now, the, the basic rationale behind horizontal interoperability is that you want to have the best of the both worlds, uh, in the sense that you want to have network effect and the benefit of network effect and the benefit of competition. You know? And by having interoperability, indeed, you can have the network effect because all networks are interoperable with each other and the competition because you can be on different network and yet benefit from, uh, you can be on a small network and yet benefit from the network effect of a bigger network. So, you know, the, the basic idea of interoperability is that you want to combine uh, inter um, network effect and competition. It's probably the, uh, the most powerful tool which allows this combination. But we know from telecom and from other industry that interoperability is very difficult to, to, to implement. And so this is why uh, the provision is also a bit different with different time frame and different form of implementation because of its complexity. I think that's also what has justified a specific and different article in the law. Uh, we, it, it becomes kind of self-evident to everybody who, who is engaged in, in, in the DMA and surrounding areas how exciting this field is. But obviously, we need new blood, essentially, and it's, it, it looks that it will be a long-standing, long uh, ambitious project. And there will be new generation of current students who live 24 seven with digital technology of understanding much more intuitively and easier all these emerging trends, et cetera. And they would be the next generation of, of doers uh, and, and players in this game. What would be your recommendation? Do you, 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 you observe this development for quite a long time. Is there any kind of emerging uh, competence maybe or some skill which, which is not very well observed by other uh, academics, maybe who teach their students, which you would probably channel to, to, to our young listen, younger listeners. So I think, yes, first, the, the one advice I would say is that um, invest time and research in big tech regulation or in tech regulation, because this is here to stay. I mean, until tech is there and tech will remain, uh, regulation will remain as well. So I think it's a good, in a way, investment to do. And it's also a fun investment because um, the things are changing all the time. You have no new policy, new uh, important policy problems. So I think that um, it's really worth to, to, uh, to study and invest in. Now, how? Um, I think one thing which is very important is to have an interdisciplinary approach. You know, I think that um, each field of um, its discipline is important, but what is really important is to be able to bridge different disciplines. You know? And I would say that here more than ever, what you need is um, a legal perspective, of course, but also you need to understand uh, AI and data. And so this combination, and that's not that frequent. I mean, it will probably become more and more, but because you know, we have a lot of people which are doing economic and law, and I think that's very um, important and interesting. But what we really need now is also people understanding um, AI uh, and data science. Uh, and, and I think that an advice that I would give is for everyone which is not specialized in that to try to specialize a little bit in that. 
Um, but really what is important is to have a kind of interdisciplinary approach. And also what is important is to um, understand the overall direction system. Because you know, sometimes we tend to be focused on a very nitty gritty interpretation of this specific provision of this specific article, which is very important. But we should not lose uh, sight of what are the overall direction that we wanted to achieve here. And I think part of the overall direction, as we say, is to have a, a, a more contestability and to some extent to go back to the promises of the internet, which was a more decentralized. Internet. And I think, you know, if you go back to the first writing of the uh, internet enthusiasts um, in, um, in the 90s, they were very enthusiastic because they, they saw the internet as an engine for change and for decentralization. I think this enthusiasm has been lost by many people because we have seen a centralization, a concentration of power. But you see, I think technology is not inevitably leading us to that. Uh, it's how we shape technology. And I think the DMA participate or may participate to that kind of more general uh, movement towards more decentralization and, uh, and, and promises for a better internet. So, so really, I think that um, it is a very interesting field um, um, intellectually, but also um, important for the, for the society. Alexandre Destrel, it was a pleasure to talk and listen and, and, and learn from you. Uh, thank you very much for your time and availability to share your excellent ideas with us. Thank you very much.